This evening I'd like to draw your attention to the story of a man who was renewed by the power of Christ. And I'll, I want to especially look at his response to that renewal of his life. This story is found over in Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. To sort of set the scene, what's been going on, Jesus has spent the day teaching the people in parables on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And as the day draws to a close and evening starts to uh, come in, he and his disciples get aboard some boats and they travel from the western bank of the Sea of Galilee over to the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. Mark chapter 5 beginning verse 1 says, And they came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gadarenes, and when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones." Now, we don't have time to get into a deep discussion about demon possession this evening, but you need to know that demon possession was a terrible affliction that affected the people who were living during the first century, during the ministry of Jesus. And to be demon-possessed meant that one or more demons took control of your body and your mind. And this was the situation that this... Gadarean man was living in. And uh, you can just picture the ordinary life that this man used to lead. I imagine that he had a regular job that he went to every day, and he came home every night to a loving family, a wife, and children. But one, one day all that came to an end because this man was possessed with demons. His life was turned upside down. And the description that the scriptures give is one of the most pitiful that I ever have seen in the Bible. It's a picture of total despair. He's completely overtaken with these demons. He doesn't have control over his body. He can't communicate with his family. There's a voice coming out of his mouth, but it's not his voice. It's somebody else's voice, a sinister, malicious voice. He doesn't have any rest. He's wandering around day and night. He doesn't have anywhere to sleep because he's been driven out of town. He's had, he has these violent outbursts, and they tried to chain him up like a wild animal, but that didn't work because of the power of the demon. And so he was driven out of town, and he is sleeping in the caves and the tombs that dot the cliffs of the Golan Heights. He's cutting himself with uh, sharp rocks. You can just imagine how he looks. He's probably covered in dried blood and, and dirt and scabs and open wounds. And he's a terror to his family and his friends. He doesn't have any friendships. He doesn't have any rest. He doesn't have any peace. He has no home. He's living in a hopeless situation. Try to imagine what that must have been like if you were in that situation or if you can't imagine what it would be like to be possessed by a demon. Try to imagine what it must have been like to be his father or his mother or his brother or his sister or his wife, his children, to watch as he's slowly consumed by this group of demons that's possessing him. Folks, this is the fate that Satan desires for you. If you've ever wondered how Satan feels towards you, what, what does Satan think of you, this is it right here. Satan doesn't care about you. He doesn't have any compassion for you or your well-being. All he wants to do is to drain you dry. And this demoniac is a picture of what it looks like to be enslaved to sin. You know, in our culture... We glorify sin. We do. We put, it on, we put sin on the cover of a magazine. 
we say, you're just satisfying your own desires. You're not really hurting anybody. Uh, as long as it feels good to you, what's the harm in that? But James 1.15 says, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. When, you, when your life looks like this, when you live in a way where you don't give any thought to any spiritual matters, uh, this is what your life looks like to God. The devil, he wants to consume you until you're nothing but a withered husk. And if you're here tonight and you're living in sin, you're living without any thought or regard for your soul, you have no other motive except to satisfy your own personal desires, you might not realize it, but this is what you look like in the sight of God. You are no better off than this man who's possessed by a demon. If you ever have trouble visualizing what sin looks like, just take a look at this demoniac. And it'll help you understand just how ugly and how grotesque sin really is. Let's read verses 6 through 8 of Mark chapter 5. It says, When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. You know, it's amazing just how different this encounter looks from the exorcisms that you see in movies and on TV. You know, in a movie, an exorcism takes place in a dark room. They've got a couple of priests there with holy water and incense and crucifixes, and they have to carry out this elaborate ritual. Sometimes the demon fights back, and it attacks the priests. It resists being cast out. But that's not what happened in the Bible. In the Bible, demons are so afraid of God that they fall down and they worship. They certainly never blaspheme. And you can see that right here. These, uh, G these demons can't stand up against Jesus. There's a lot of things that are difficult to understand about demons and the effect that they can have on people. But this point is clear, at least. Jesus has mastery over the demons. Not in the way that the Pharisees accused him of. He, he's not the prince of demons or the ruler of demons. He's the subjugator of demons. Demons have to bow and submit to Jesus. Demons aren't allowed, aren't allowed to do anything that Jesus does not permit them to do. Just as through calming the storm, Jesus shows his mastery over nature, he shows his mastery over the supernatural forces of creation through casting out demons. Now, verses 9 through 13 says, Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. You know, the legion is the ultimate symbol of Rome's might and its power to oppress people. Five to 6,000 soldiers. And uh, the fact that the demons decided to call themselves after a legion shows the kind of power that they must have possessed. But when they were confronted with the power of God, this entire army of demons pled for mercy. They didn't stand a chance. Maybe you're concerned tonight about demons or spiritual forces and what kind of influence that they can have over your life. Maybe you're concerned, uh, how can I fight against Satan? How can I fight against the influence of demons if I can't even see them? Well, the Bible shows us that if you're on Jesus' side, you have nothing to fear. 
because Jesus has ultimate power over the demons. James 4 verse 7 says, If you first submit to God, and second, you resist the devil, he will flee from you. It's as simple as that. If you're following Christ, demons have no power over you. This is what this man did here, this demoniac. He submitted to God and see the result. In verses 14 and 15, it said, So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid. As you can imagine, word must have spread quickly to people in the surrounding towns and villages. They run out to see what's happened to their herds of pigs. They run out to see what's happened with this man who was possessed by a demon. And they're astonished to find the demoniac sitting, clothed in his right mind at the feet of Jesus. This demoniac came to Jesus in the state that he was in, and he left Jesus in the state that he needed to be in. He was healed, he was cleansed, and he was complete. He had been renewed. His life had been renewed by the power of Christ because Jesus has power over the things that would overpower us. Ephesians 4 verse 8 says, Christ led captivity captive. This is the power that Christ has or the, the power that Christ can have in your life. If you'll allow him in, he has the ability to cleanse you from guilt and sin and shame. He can raise you up. He can make you a new creature. You can be alive in him. This is the effect Christ can have on your life, but only if you're willing. Look at verses 16 and 17. It says, And those who saw it told to them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. These people witnessed the power of Jesus, the power that he had to change lives, and they were terrified out of their minds. And they begged Jesus to leave, to leave the country. They were so afraid of his power. You know, Jesus has power over the natural and the supernatural, but there's only one thing that Jesus' power cannot overcome, and that's your free will. If you are not willing to allow Christ to cleanse you, then he won't do it. Christ will not force himself on you. You have to willingly submit to his power. But if you resist, if you ask him to leave, he will. Verses 18 and 19 says, When he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit it. Now, this is interesting. Jesus permitted the request of the demons. He acquiesced to the request of these townspeople. He's getting ready to get back in the boat and to leave them but he denies the request of the one person who's been the most excited about him. He denies the request of this man whose life he's just radically changed. Why won't Jesus let this man follow after him as a disciple? Well, I think there's two reasons. First of all, this man's a Gentile. He's living in a region where these, these people are not Jews, but they are Gentiles. And the time isn't right for Jews and Gentiles to be united in Christ. Not just yet. It's not quite time. So he has to stay. But Jesus doesn't just turn him away to do nothing. In fact, Jesus gives him a commission. Jesus gives him something to do. In fact, you might even call this the first commission of preaching that Jesus ever gave anybody. It's certainly the first commission to the Gentiles Here's what Jesus tells him to do. He says, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. Jesus instructs this man to go and share the gospel 
with those who it's, he's going to be most effective with. He's going to go to his friends, his family, his neighbors, people who might not listen to Jesus at this point. But they certainly knew about their friend who had been demon-possessed. They're going to listen to him and his testimony. And this demoniac does this. Verse 20 says, He departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. This demoniac goes home. He tells his family the great things that have been done for him. But he doesn't stop there. He goes out and he begins to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ all over the region of the ten cities. And you, you remember the attitude of these folks. They're not interested in Jesus at this point. Well, in Mark 7, Jesus and the disciples come back to this area after this man has been around preaching. And you know what? People receive him with open arms. People are running to bring the sick to him to be healed. Crowds are following him. This is where the feeding of the 4,000 takes place. This is the kind of effect that someone who has been affected by the gospel can have on their friends and their neighbors. So in conclusion, if you're a Christian here tonight, I want to challenge you. Are you showing the same enthusiasm for the gospel that the demoniac displayed? Are you telling people about the work that Christ has had in renewing your life? Certainly this man was marvelously blessed by this exorcism Jesus performed. But you know what? We've been blessed by the Savior too. What's stopping us from sharing the good news with the world? You know, you don't have to have a college degree to spread the gospel. Maybe you're concerned that nobody is going to listen to you. Well, just look at what this demoniac accomplished with his countrymen. He converted people to Christ in droves. You know, not many people are converted by debates or by books. Uh, not even everyone's converted from sermons. But there are many, many people who are converted by the influence that their friend, their co-worker, their family member, their neighbor had when they lived out the gospel in front of them. Maybe you're afraid you don't, won't know what to say. The gospel is as simple as the commission Jesus gives the demoniac. He says, tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. That's the simplest way to evangelize and to tell people what God has done for you. Tell them how Christ has transformed your life by saving you from your sins. Tell them about the tremendous blessing it is to be a part of the church and to have this support network. Tell them about the hope and the purpose that the gospel of Christ gives to your life. Tell them about the peace that comes from giving up your problems and laying them at the feet of Jesus and relying on him. The Lord does need preachers who are willing to go to foreign countries to spread the gospel, but he needs just as many people who are willing to spread the gospel to their friends and to their neighbors. So if you're a Christian tonight, you've experienced a renewal of your life through Christ, don't hold it in. Don't hold it back. Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. Thank you.